just to sort of formally introduce you, um, I'm really happy to be talking to Mara Gordon uh, today on this uh, Tech Open Air um, podcast. And um, your personal path is, has been really inspiring to us. And I'm uh, very grateful for us having the chat today. I'm very grateful as well. Thank you for including me. I appreciate it, especially the opportunity to talk tech, because that's that's my passion. There, one of my passions, yes. So yeah, Mara, I'd love to uh, sort of start out by talking a little bit about your personal path into the cannabis industry and um, also seeing how much you've done in this space, how much you've started um, and, and sort of the, you know, the intersection of those different companies. It almost seems like there's a, a flywheel uh, in motion, right? Where one company sort of feeds into the next. Um, yeah. Maybe talk us through a little bit about your path into it and, and then these three companies that um, at least I'm aware of uh, that, that you right, co-founded. Right, right. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I know, right? It's crazy. So um, I, my, my background is uh, as a process engineer. I worked in technology. I worked in, you know, the whole dot-com world of insanity. Um, and, uh, and then I had my last position out in, 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 I call it in the straight world, the real world, um, where I was the head of methodology and process engineering for Safeway uh, worldwide, the supermarket chain. And um, to say the work was not fulfilling would be an understatement. Uh, I, I didn't, I, did, I couldn't find the nugget of service in there other than educating people and helping them to do a better job. But you know, I wanted something more and uh, my health was deteriorating. I had had some uh, health challenges and it just was like, you know what? I don't need the money. I don't need the stress. It's not, it's not adding value to my life. So I, I retired um, uh, completely and just thought, you know what? I'll just figure out ways to do things to help people and I'll just do it voluntarily, whatever. And can I just well, briefly ask, like when you were saying you don't need the money, was that also a, you don't need an awful lot of money? Like you were just content with, you know, the life that you had at that point and you just didn't seek for more or was it also, I'm just, you know, good enough? It's a it question was, I think that a lot of people even, you know, now in, in early stages of their career go through, right? Like, you know, how much do I actually need? Like, you know, how much do I need to strive for the anxiety also around the future and financial security and so forth? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and I'm glad you brought it up. So in 1984, I read a book called Wishcraft by Barbara Scher. And she has you go through and figure out what your, what your, what your real wishes are, what you want to do. And then how to figure out how to do it. But one of the exercises in the beginning of the book was to um, write down in detail, in minute detail, what a perfect day looks like for you. And a perfect day for me was so simple. I mean, it was, it, it required so little. I mean, I grew up in an environment where it was like yachts and big houses and, and you know, boarding schools and all the fancy. But the reality is what made my perfect day was intellectual discourse, you know, a, a good bottle of wine, you know, a good loaf of bread, some cheese and some interesting people. I mean, that's really what it required. Maybe a nice bicycle. I didn't need much. And so, very European. Very much so, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it let me know that there was really no point in me pursuing, you know, numbers, you know. So um, that helped me to not have this you know, fear of missing out and having to have more and be able to pursue the things that I want. Um, and when I, when I talk about having enough money, I mean, I was, as, I was able to make decisions about what I would and wouldn't do based upon what I wanted to do, not what I could do. And that to me is the definition of having enough money. If the things that, that I desire can be done with what I have, then I have enough. And if they aren't, then I have to figure out how to make more so that I can do those things, right? And I'm fortunate that there's just not that much that I want. And it, I wanted to bring this up lastly, actually, but uh, now that we're kind of in the myth of, of that topic, before we then actually get to, to uh, the business side of things, um, I saw on your Twitter profile, you were uh, writing Maslow was right. Um, so how, how, how did you mean that in that context though? Because with you know the Maslow sort of steps and, and pyramid, 
you know, aren't we striving always for one more layer um, of, of fulfillment? Or how did I, you mean it? What I mean is I believe that I have sought out self-actualization mm -hmm. from the very beginning. And the, the reality is the way that I define self-actualization is achieving what it is that I have set out as my goals that bring me contentment and happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, I don't suffer fear of missing out. I don't, for any of that, I'm, I feel like the path I live is the path that's right for me. And if other people wanna follow and, and join me, that's awesome. But this is what works for me. So that's really it. I mean, the other thing is that I mean about Maslow is there's really no point in talking to people about, you know, some of the, the higher level thinking if they're focused on a roof over their head and sure. food on the table. And it's arrogant to do that. So to mm -hmm. understand when I meet somebody, where yeah. are they on their path? Yeah. And so that I can meet them there. Yeah. And, and that's really what it's about. All right, let's segue back. Um, very interesting. Uh, so, so you quit your job. So yeah, so I, I, I retired, you know, I was 40, 43 or 44 years old. I was pretty young. And uh, I mean, relatively, of course. And um, uh, my health was, was, you know, in question. My husband was having issues and he's sober, he's sober alcoholic and not able to or willing to use any kind of opioids. And we went on this journey, we went to Colorado, nobody mentioned cannabis to us, nobody had in California either. We then sold the house there and went on a two year road trip where we just went around meeting people all over the world and helping where we could. And when we came back to California because uh, he broke his back and needed surgery, we started uh, researching uh, alternatives to opioids. And cannabis kept coming up um, as a uh, potential uh, option. This was like 2010. Mm -hmm. And um, so I immediately did what I do. I started researching and looking for how to know what to take and how to take it. And there was nothing, there was just nothing. And when I would ask people, they would, they would say, there's no such thing as data around cannabis. I'm like, well, how do you know how to take, what to take, what the chemical profile, all of the logical questions that I would look at. And when nobody could was doing it, I thought, well, I, you know, I can do this. Let me just do it myself. And that's what started it. I started, uh, I started out uh, making the infused oils and then putting them into my Aunt Zelda's carrot cake recipe. Yeah. Which is the name. <laughs> because it was it, because it has to have a lot of oil. And yeah. so I had to find a recipe with a lot of oil in it. And um, I started weighing every piece and measuring and asking people if they would take it and let me know how they felt and you know and and then started lab testing each batch very early on and it just you know I, I I was angry that no physician no doctor had ever said to me you know you might want to try cannabis or than my husband especially my husband who had no other alternatives um, that were viable for him and so I thought what was it going to take to introduce this to physicians in such a way that they just add it to their toolbox. It's not like I'm saying, you know, cannabis instead. I'm saying cannabis as an option along with when it's appropriate. So I just laid out the, the model of what I thought that was gonna take and then started companies to achieve it. Um, I had another company that, um, that I've, I've, I've now kind of segued off and allowing the doctors to do it on their own it was called Calispring Wellness. And it was so that we could do the telemedicine so that doctors could talk to the patients, giving them the dosing guidelines, and then we could follow and track what was working and how. So um, uh, I, left, I leave that to the doctors now that they're trained and they know how to do it and focus more on, you know, it's gonna take uh, lab tested medicine. It's gonna take um, uh, uh, in-depth patient intake. It'll take understanding that what the cannabinoids and terpenes do, what their actual values and benefits are, um, a dosing strategy, feedback from the patients and all those things. So I thought, well, how do I create that? And so each one of the companies came out of that. 
And it's all yeah. very data driven, uh, right? That's the, data -driven. at the core of it. Are, are there some data points you can share with us uh, on, on sort of the uh, development of those companies and the stages they're in? Yes, yes. Well, so Aunt Zelda's was always intended as a, uh, as a way of making sure that we understood the medicine well enough that when a patient was using it and gave us uh, uh, objective feedback, we could validate that it was working or not. And we used the validation of what was working as a way of giving them their refills on the medicine. So it was a great way to entice them to give us the data. If they didn't share with us what their status was, we didn't give them more medicine. So we were able to get this data flow. It was the only way to get compliance really mm -hmm. uh, and cooperation. People are, are, are relatively um, lackadaisical about their healthcare um, feedback loop. And um, so once I was able to then develop a software platform to, to track all the data and um, to start making uh, predictive algorithms around what was going to work and what not, you know, rules based on the back end and then predictive, um, we were able to get smarter and smarter with it. Um, Aunt Zelda's is uh, now um, I'm moving it to a, it's, I'm licensing it around the world. Like I have a license in South Africa, we're in Brazil. We're gonna be you know, still in California, of course, moving into other states as well with it. And uh, interestingly, not in Australia, even though we have Zalira Therapeutics, which <laughs> was started as Zelda Therapeutics there. Yep. I mean, I'd love to, you know, talk a little bit about the market uh, and, and for people who are maybe new to it also, a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs or, or want to start and build something on their own. Can you map the market a little bit, maybe from a geographical perspective? You just mentioned a few markets that you're in. Um, is it all, you know, winner takes all like we've seen in software in, and it's all going to be based in California or, or what other interesting markets uh, do you see? and, and geogra geographies around the world. And, and maybe you could help us map the, the, just the product overview a little bit, like there's cannabis, there's hemp, there's CBD, um, there's THC, you know, what are you seeing? What type of dynamics in that space at the moment? You know, I, uh, I, I posted something yesterday on uh, social media. Somebody had put a, a, a GIF out there of me saying a quote of mine about the hemp industry. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to share it, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, people talk about me. I'm going to talk about myself once in a while. And oh my God, the pushback that I got from the hemp, you know, the hemp hustlers, as I call them, was not pretty. Um, uh, I believe that what, uh, let's, let's, let's focus for a minute before yeah. I give my opinions <laughs> about the valid value of it. The U.S. right now is saturated by CBD companies, mm -hmm. hemp CBD companies. Uh, much to the detriment of patients. Mm -hmm. How come? Uh, because the there isn't the regulatory oversight of the products. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to know what you're getting when you buy your product that it actually contains what it says it does. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the problem is these, these uh, crops are being grown as, you know, biomass to get the instead of out of you know medicine, which is we think about cannabis as being a much more um, um, full spectrum plant, you know, or, or a way of making medicine. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the CBD that's being gleaned from hemp, I would rather see them growing fields of hemp for industrial purposes to clean the soil, to create textiles and fuels and all the amazing things that this planet needs, instead of growing varieties that don't support industrial development, but just you're forgetting the CBD. You know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's exploiting instead of enhancing uh, the, 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 the market and the environment. Um, so that really bothers me. It bothers me that it's, I can't get a, a grower who previously was growing a high CBD plants for us to out of the cannabis side of it on the regulatory side to continue to grow because they've been priced out of the market by the hemp growers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who don't have the regulation because regulation is ridiculous the way it's been implemented. I not when I say regulation, I don't mean it's all good. It's just that we do need to have some sort of protections for people. Uh, in the US right now on the cannabis side of things, 
it's, it's rolling out state by state. And um, I sit on an advisory board for a company called Access and Innovation, and it's a, a uh, lobbying group to DC on the Hill to see about getting uh, you know, the right kind of oversights in, in the right kind of uh, legalization process in place. And we had a meeting a couple of days ago and we were talking about the frustrations of, of this and the fact that uh, it looks like they're waiting at a federal level until there's uh, a, a couple of multi-state operators and the pharma is ready to take over and tobacco is ready to take over and alcohol is ready to take over and only then will they allow it. So I do believe that we're gonna see a culling of the herd, so to speak, mm -hmm. and a lot of really, really good players are gonna be gone. Um, and and it's, it's very, very unfortunate, but I, I just think that that's kind of the way it's going. Uh, at least that's the way it appears. Yeah. And, and so you would argue that CBD in terms of health benefits um, is overrated compared to THC or? I definitely would say it's overrated compared to THC. Mm -hmm. um, I've been very vocal about that. CBD is fantastic. It has all sorts of benefits. Mm -hmm. I recommend it uh, to almost every one of our patients, mm -hmm. um, but not without THC. Mm -hmm. You really need to have the, the full spectrum of the plant and what's in there. You don't have to have a lot, but you do have to have some. The other thing is CBD is not as innocuous as some people think. I mean, there are in fact potential harms because of drug on drug interactions mm -hmm. that people need to really be aware of. And people are treating it like it's candy. Mm, that's true, <laughs> yeah. Well, they put it in candy, yes. I know, <laughs> serious medicine, you know, and, so. But but let's say for somebody who, you know, is sober um, or, you know, generally maybe afraid of the, the psychoactive in, ingredient of, of THC, is, is CBD a good alternative for that? Or, or are, do we have a misconception around, you know, THC also in that, in that view? There definitely is a misconception. Uh, first of all, I would say that THC and CBD are not either or. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, it's and. Um, there are some conditions that they overlap and they both work for, but that's not the case in many things. Um, for example, when I use CBD, it makes me feel anxious. It makes mm -hmm. me feel very irritable. Um, when I, when I use THC, it depends on the, 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 the uh, profile of the medicine that I'm using, but it has a very different effect. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, if I was going to use it for sleep, for example, that wouldn't be an option for me for CBD. Some people it works for. Mm -hmm. um, but I really do believe that, that THC, when administered correctly in a therapeutic dose, does not cause psychoactivity mm -hmm. any more than a, a, you know, your morning cup of coffee does mm -hmm. um, or, you know, uh, having a glass of wine or something like that. It really doesn't. Um, it's when people take too much. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had, we've had children. Uh, I don't know if you saw the documentary or heard of Weed the People, yep. but we had children that were on, you know, 700 milligrams of THC a day and going to school, you know, because if when you titrate correctly in the small increments and you wait till you um, acclimate at each level, you get to where you're getting the medicinal benefits of it without having to feel any kind of mm -hmm. psychotropic effect. And what about intolerances? So I've had this discussion prior to our interview with a few friends and uh, some of them actually have told me that they, they feel, you know, when they take these type of products that, you know, they get puffy or there's some type of, you know, maybe intolerance out there, but they feel like the industry is not really you know, letting them know about potential intolerances. Is, is that something where you, you feel like more work needs to be done or? Yes. You know what? I, I don't consider myself part of the cannabis industry. Yeah. I'm myself part of the healthcare industry. Yeah. And so I take a very different view towards it. Mm -hmm. I also am not a product company. I have mm -hmm. products, but the products are so that I can get the data and so I can help doctors to treat their patients mm -hmm. so it's a mean the products are a means to the end mm -hmm. and uh if you think of cannabis as a you know cpg you know as a consumer packaged yep. good yeah. 
then you're going to put your bottom line and shareholders uh, ahead of what you're going to do for people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, we have to make sure that we're putting people first and the people aren't just your board, you know. And then in terms of medicinal uh, benefits, can you give us some examples of what you see today and what you feel like we will see in the future? Right. Well, I've seen tremendous uh, benefit for people that have, uh, I call it the trifecta. And that is, you know, pain, anxiety, and sleep. Those are the three things that are just absolutely cannabis should be the first thing out of the doctor's toolbox and recommending for patients. And even when they're looking to self-medicate, you know, like an over-the-counter type product, um, those are the three things that I've seen phenomenal benefits. In fact, with uh, the sleep, I had created a sleep product or a formulation, I want to say about 2011 or 12. And we treated many, many patients with it, including myself. And uh, we had enough data to justify doing a clinical trial uh, at uh, Zelda Therapeutics, you know, knowing beforehand pretty much what the results were going to be, hmm. uh, which of course eliminates a lot of the risk of the, of the uh, it's so expensive to run clinical trials. So to know beforehand what's going to work is very beneficial. Also, I mean, the, the work that we've done in cancers in particular, um, preclinically, but also, you know, on research, but also on the work we've done in treating patients themselves, um, I, it's unbelievable. I mean, there's, there's one little girl in particular, she came to us at two and a half years old. Her, um, we weren't even taking new patients at the time but they, her mom begged because the child was in so much pain from a terminal brain tumor. She was going into hospice and she was, the child was like beating her head against the wall because of the pain. We started helping her and like immediately within the day, the pain stopped. And then the next time she went to the doctor, the doctor saw, the oncologist saw differences in her that justified doing another MRI and checking to see what the status was of her disease. Long story short, she was she's out of she went out of hospice and she's now, let's see, that was 2000, that was that was like February 2014. And she's in school, she has a little brother, she's had a life. I mean, come on. Do I say it's all cannabis? No. But if it is a if it it was enough that the doctors could justify doing allopathic treatment in addition to it, instead of just saying there's no hope, mm -hmm. you know? And and what about sort of, you know, I, I'll, I'll quote my mom on this. Uh, hi, mom. Uh, you know, the the so, so, sort of the, you know, um, fear of trying something like this. How, is that something that, um, you know, can be learned? Is that a way of us also training our mind to kind of let go maybe also in the process of, you know, maybe having a psychoactive, uh, you know, reaction and, and kind of leaning into it? Or is that also something that for some people, it just doesn't work and they better stay away from it? That is such an excellent question. So I was one of those people who <laughs> I tried cannabis with when I, when I was young. I hated it. It made me feel disassociative. It made me feel paranoid. It made mm -hmm. me feel very... I'm a bit introverted by nature anyway, so it made me feel like detached, which is something that I didn't need to be more of than I already was. So um, I was always like, oh, I tried, I didn't even know the word cannabis. I said, I tried marijuana, didn't like it, didn't work for me. Um, when I first started experimenting with it again, now, you know, for medical benefits, um, I did uh, I, I took four puffs when I should have taken two puffs and everybody in my house went to sleep and I was left paranoid, freaking out, whatever. And I thought, okay, I have an opportunity here because I'm surrounded by people who love me. I'm safe. If I get into trouble, there's someone there. And uh, I just thought, okay, I am going to pay attention and observe what it is that so many people like about this medicine. And I, by detaching from it, and I know this sounds a little bit hoo-hoo-y, but by detaching from the experience and observing it, mm -hmm. 
I was able to recognize and feel safe in the fact that it wasn't me, it was the medicine. Yeah, yeah. So by detaching, so I have actually walked many, many people through this process of detaching from the effect if they're uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and just recognizing it's the medicine, it'll go away, observe it, figure out what you like, what you don't like, but don't make it about you because it's not, it's the medicine. It's it's a little trick that works. It's it's a mindfulness practice, right? It is. Mindfulness practice. Yeah. in 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 basically in total in action and uh yeah that that's 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 a really interesting one um and people I, need to use much less than they think they do yeah 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 so those people take too much it's it's uh it, it reminds me of what somebody told me um you know i i used to have stage fright and as a conference organizer who has to be on stage a lot. Um, <laughs> it was a bit of an issue. And, uh, and you know, these simple tricks can be so powerful. Somebody told me, you know, if you get that moment, you're on stage, you're interviewing somebody, you have to do a moderation or whatever, free speak, just count backwards, you know, take in any number, five, four, three, two, one, that's sometimes enough. Uh, or maybe you go from 10 backwards. And just, and, and that, that, that is the same, you know, it leads to that kind of detachment um, of the situation um, and, you know, just putting your brain towards something else than being in this loop of, you know, of fear um, can be super powerful and, and helpful. Um, and now, so, I, it, you know, maybe too personal of a question, so feel free to skip, but like, are you now on a total um, experimental uh, path? Um, you're in Mexico right now, lots of plant medicine around. I've been on an experimental with plant medicine for many, many, many years. Um, I started I started experimenting in the 1970s with yeah. mushrooms, mm-hmm. uh, you know, peyote, um, mm-hmm. psilocybin, LSD. Mm-hmm. And I started a few years ago experimenting with uh, MDMA and ayahuasca mm-hmm. and ketamine and, you know, all sorts of uh, drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and I find them to be transformational. I've been able to accomplish in 30, well, in three hours, what would take 30 years of therapy, mm-hmm. you know, with other, in other situations with some of the drugs. So absolutely. And I'm looking for at this next stage of, you know, of my life, of, of mm-hmm. this life, to um, connect with like-minded people who are on a journey and uh, of growth and learning and learning about more plants. Um, I sit on the board of a company in in South Africa called Psilocybin Mm -hmm. and another company in in, uh, Canada that may be merging with Psilocybin because uh, I have some very strong opinions about mushrooms. Uh, In fact, interestingly enough, as a side thing, Mm -hmm. mushrooms I prefer as a single molecule or psychedelics I prefer as a single molecule Whereas cannabis, I like as a full spectrum, whole plant, um, I, because it's one thing to be unpredictable on cannabis. It's another thing to be unpredictable on a on a uh, psychedelic journey. You don't necessarily want to have that. Um, so, in what it, way would you say is it uh, does it have different benefits than being sort of solo monocle? Like, is it more surgical? Um, you know, would you say mushrooms like for very specific? you know, planned and, and kind of customized experience and journey that needs to be uh, accompanied by, by professionals? Or, or how would you say? Um, I would say that the thing about mushrooms is they are less predictable. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, you know, when anytime you're working with something that has multiple uh, compounds within it, there are things that are going to be different the same way one cannabis medicine can make you feel very uplifted and another one can make you feel like you're couch locked. It's the same thing with mushrooms. And um, I don't know enough about all of the chemical compounds. Frankly, I've never seen a, and that's one of the reasons I'm excited about it, it having a new type of, of product coming out of this where we do know everything that's in there and can start making predictions. Mm-hmm. So um, Octopi Wellness is the, is the uh, platform that I uh, built and I'm rebuilding it now for the next, I think we're planning on the next hundred doctors in mid-April mm-hmm. uh, to release it to. 
And, uh, and it says on there, it says plant medicines because I'm including you know, all sorts of plant medicines. Uh, I think that, and also other chemicals as well, such as LSD and MDMA and ketamine, because these are very, very powerful tools for treating uh, all sorts of conditions that, that there's just really nothing in their alternative in the, in the uh, mm -hmm. pharmacopoeia to, to replace them. So you would say also that chemicals, uh, sort of non-organic uh, drugs, so to speak, uh, have their place as well and, and, and can be complementary. 100%. Yeah. You know, I was on 26, uh, 20, I think I always say 26, and my husband says 31, but I, I'm going to stick with 26, different pharmaceuticals all at the same time back before I found cannabis. Um, now I'm on three pharmaceuticals. But I need all three of those. Mm -hmm. Cannabis isn't a panacea. Mushrooms aren't a panacea. There's all sorts of other things. I mean, thank goodness we have pharma, you know, pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the pharmaceutical industry I'm not real thrilled with. Mm -hmm. You know, but it, but but you know, but uh, pharmaceuticals have an absolute benefit as well. I mean, I my, one of my sisters is, or my other only sister that's left now is going through chemotherapy right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, for breast cancer. I have her on cannabis right along with it, but I wouldn't say to her in the type she has, has a very high success rate with chemotherapy. I would never say to her, don't do chemotherapy, only do uh, uh, cannabis. And I think people that do say those things are irresponsible. Yeah, good point. Um, so I'd love to spend the last uh, part of of our conversation uh, talking a little bit about you as a founder and you know of multiple companies and you know having uh, great successes like I, I just want to sort of unravel a little bit how you do it um, and uh, also now I mean let's start with this situation now with the pandemic uh, we just briefly talked um, before we started about you having sold your house in the United States um, and now going on this journey of being three months in a given country and how do you manage your life and how do you manage your business at the same time? Is it all remote, the company, or have you just managed to build processes that um, allow you to spend less time on the company or like what, what's, what's the secret sauce here? Yeah, that's a very good question. So in, uh, let's start with uh, Zelda Therapeutics, Zelda mm -hmm. Therapy, excuse me. <laughs> um, uh, we merged with Alira Healthcare back in the end of 2019, and I stepped off the board and stepped onto the advisory mm -hmm. as it's in it. So it's, it's, I consider it, you know, the plates are spinning, mm -hmm. you know, and as long as the plates are spinning, I don't have to be the one that's spinning them. Mm -hmm. As long as I can have some sort of an influence or say on anything that I'm happy, I don't have to be, you know, actually, obviously, um, I have strong opinions about directions here and there, and I don't always win. But when anytime you go public, you kind of lose your ability to operate um, the way you want exactly anyway. I'm very happy with the direction we're taking. Um, the chairman of the board, Osagi, is a brilliant, brilliant man. I'm very happy with that. So he and I meet from time to time. He's sitting in his place in Philadelphia, and I'm in my place wherever I am on our laptops with Zoom. Um, the first purchase I think I made after the pandemic started was a, a Zoom membership or a contract <laughs> so that I could not get kicked off after 40 minutes. And um, so that's been very beneficial. And uh, Aunt Zelda's, I have uh, my, uh, uh, the gentleman that's my partner in Octopi Wellness has taken over the day-to-day -day running of Aunt Zelda's. I still do all the formulating. I still make the decisions on product development and you know what markets we go in and things like that. But I don't longer have to run the day to day of it. And I'm focused um, at this stage. You know, my time is being spent on the software. I spend almost all of my time on you know. Obviously, I have a ridiculous email stream of patients with inquiries and you know, interview requests and all these different things that I have to deal with in my time as well um, and get to deal with, I should say. But um, the, the platform is very, very important to me. And I don't think I would have had the time to focus it the way I do if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. 
So it's kind of the, the, the silver lining of the cloud is that I've had this opportunity to not be on an airplane every week somewhere. Um, and uh, once it's up and going, it's gonna be supporting telemedicine. It's gonna be supporting doctors all over the world, um, helping them. Uh, everything is being done. Everything you need to do now, you can pretty well do online. Um, uh, I'm not doing the day-to-day -day of a manufacturing facility anymore. I had one called the oil plant that I started after California um, went legal in 2016, but I realized I have less than no interest in running a manufacturing plant, so I sold it and uh, licensed Aunt Zelda's instead to follow our SOPs and everything else. Um, and so, you know, you had asked a question before that I don't think I really talked about different markets around the world for different things. I mean, I think in the United States, it's going to end up being just these multi-state operators. And that's good. I think it's going to be, you know, there might be some artisan here and there. I think that uh, 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 Brazil is going to be an incredible market. I think Africa is going to be all over Africa. Not out that, but all over African continent, I think has incredible opportunity. Mexico, my gosh, it's going to explode here, um, and so I'm, I'm actually kind of tickled to be here and, and to you know see how I can help people to be successful here. Um, definitely. And and one question I I ask in all my podcast interviews um, because I I feel from the conversations I've had with founders of various stages in in their companies. Um, that seems to be a common thread is this sort of challenge in deciding whether to iterate a product. And we're always told, you know, we got to be agile. We got to keep on iterating the product until it becomes, you know, perfect or we have, you know, great product market fit um, versus, you know, this total pivot uh, and realizing this is a dead end and I need to really pivot the company into a totally different direction. Have you been at uh, points like that in, in your company and was there a framework or how did you go about making that decision? 100%, um, my father taught me very young that it takes more courage to quit something than it does to continue. And um, my whole life has been about pivoting from one thing, it's like seeing seeing where I need to make adjustments, but also keeping my eye on where I'm going. What is my ultimate goal? And my ultimate goal has been quite simple, to create an environment, to create a tool that physicians can dose their patients correctly using all sorts of medicine, including cannabis, and not, and not um, uh, be afraid of it. Anyway, so that's that's always been the goal. And with that being in mind, um, for example, I started Aunt Zelda's, it was a, it was a, uh, a nonprofit collective. And when legalization came out, it was a different, a different landscape. All of a sudden you had to worry about being on dispensary shelves. I'd never been on a dispensary shelf, didn't care about being on a dispensary shelf. I didn't care if some, you know, 21 year old bud tender thought my products were cool. I could care less, you know, that's not who I'm marketing to. So um, it was very easy for me to pivot away from wanting to build that as a, uh, a company in the new environment. I still think it's important to have the products out there 100%, but for my focus, it was like, if you wanna do it, awesome. I will empower you, I will enable you, but I'm no longer gonna spend my time and energy there. Um, I, I, see that the, the path that I've taken has had multiple pivots in it. And one of those has been that I don't also want to own a medical practice. You know, I needed to have the medical practice so that I could train the doctors and, and you know, do all these things and control the conversation and the data flow. But once I got all them up and going, I didn't have to do that anymore. So let each of us do what we do best and focus myself because you know you cannot run multiple companies at the same time so you do them all poorly so it was like at the beginning um i was able to kind of do it when it was small scale but as things started getting bigger and bigger there's no way i also know that i'm not interested in the day-to-day -day operations of a business you know it's not the part where i where i shine and anything that I can hire and have somebody do that does better than me, let them do it. 
so that I can focus on what I do well and what I love and what brings me joy. And, and just finally, then I read also that you uh, you know you call it macro management, which 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 I like in, in the sense of you know it seems you know that you have put a lot of trust in the people that you work with, uh, and that frees time for you, right? Um, that you can uh, invest into doing what you do best, which seems to be right. sort of the you know visionary part, the, the strategic part, and and uh, you know driving. Uh, this motion forward or starting the spin of the of the plates right. um, but how do you measure success then like how do you measure um, the people uh, around you and and how does that process look like for you well when I say I macro manage and and I really do and I've, I've had quite a, a successful run of that and loyalty and, and retention of employees has been amazing um, uh, as a result of that, I still have goals for them. It's just how they reach them is up to them. We still have projects that have to be completed and they have to be completed on time and we have to be completed on budget, but how they get there, it's up to them. So that's really, that's really what I mean by that is, and that's measurable. I mean, that's easily measurable. Um, and also, you know, I, I, I'm very close with our staff, but I'm not buddy buddy. They all know I'm still, you know, uh, we we you know we spend time together. Well, before the pandemic, of course, yeah. we would socialize to a limited extent. But I didn't worry about being their friend. Mm -hmm. I worried about right. All right, worry is not the right word. I focus on being available, being of service, helping them to be successful, because that uplifts all of us. But, you know, I keep personalities out of it, you know, and um, when we hire, it, it's, you know, pretty much everybody talks to anybody that gets hired so that we make sure that there's a fit personality wise, skill wise and whatnot. Um, I didn't used to do that and we had a couple of bad hires. And so that it seemed to make more sense to have, you know, people, because what we do, we work hard. We work very, very hard, and part of it is the passion. And if you don't have that, or you have your own ulterior motives, then you may not be a good fit with our organization. Yeah, it seems to be sort of the the cultural tenets, right? Um, I used to work at Amazon, and, and what I found really impressive there uh, was there were these thirteen what they call leadership principles, and they were very clearly defined and that allowed actually for my boss who was sitting in Seattle and I was in Berlin to hardly engage with me. Um, but I knew that I could make decisions myself based on that framework of these cultural tenets um, that were really lived and breathed uh, in the company day to day. Um, and, you know, I guess you can always argue whether those are the right cultural tenets, but um, it, what really worked well was uh, that framework for decision making for everybody in the company that was just clearly visible on the website. It's even visible to anybody. It's public, uh, you know, these these principles. And um, as long as you kind of stuck your decision and you could relate it back to one of those, uh, you wouldn't yeah. get in trouble <laughs> with your boss. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe I should come up with my own tenants to put out there or borrow them from Amazon. But, exactly. you know, you know. Um, we had an inspection at our manufacturing plant, uh, and I, I, of course, this was a perfect opportunity for the lab director to shine. Mm -hmm. You know, I stayed in the very back. I didn't even go on most of the tour because I knew that he would feel more comfortable if he was getting to be the star and without my distraction there. But I overheard him speaking. This was with some regulators, and I and I overheard him say. We, every batch of medicine that we make, we treat it as if we are giving it to a member of our own family who has no immune system and is, is, and is deathly ill. And that's the level of quality that we put into every single batch that we make. And I thought, okay, I'm done. I've done my job. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm done. laughs> that's the tenant number one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I was like, okay, as long as I have people who I'm that are working for with us yeah. that feel that way, I can feel safe 
putting my attention in other places. So I just need him to report in from time to time, let me know what he needs, does he run into any obstacles, that sort of thing. And other than that, I trust him to be a grown up and do his job. Mara, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, calling in from Mexico. Um, I send all my best wishes to you um, for now and, and for the future. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you.